Okay, in this one, I'm going to show you how I made this render from start to finish here. So I got the idea for this, right, as I was about to fall asleep, just laying down with my eyes closed. And this image of some sort of pathway weaving up to something uh, popped into my head. So I got up and I wrote down the idea, went to sleep, and the next day I started making this right here. So I recorded the entire process from start to finish, and I've just cut it down to this video here. And I'll just explain what I was thinking and what I was doing the whole way through to end up with this result right here. So here's that recording. Okay, so I'm just starting this one out with a scene blockout by just adding some basic cubes and then moving those around into the general 3D structure of the scene that I roughly know I want. So the point of doing this is that it just gives you, well, it, it lets you visualize the basic outline of the scene. What that does is it makes it very, not very easy, but a lot easier with the following steps after that, just because when you can kind of see the basic outline of what you want, it makes it a lot easier to move forward from there. Something happens when you can see the basic 3D outline, the basic blueprint of what you want to create. It makes it a lot easier with all the following steps after that. So I really like doing this because it just, it gives you the best start to the render possible a lot of the time. So I'm just doing this by extruding this thing, moving it around with proportional editing and just getting it to the rough shape of the rough idea that I have in my head. And then I'm just getting some very basic lighting in here as well. And then some very basic sculpting. Um, again, I'm just doing this with the computer mouse, no tablet. People keep telling me to get a tablet, but I don't care because I'm not trying to make this actually good. I'm just trying to get a very rough blob of something that looks roughly like some sort of natural thing. And then the texture here is what's going to carry out all the detail. So one thing I wish I'd done is I use dynamic topology, but I wish I'd actually used a multi-resolution modifier because that would have let me subdivide it more. And in this case, I just felt like there weren't quite enough polygons for the displacement. It ended up being kind of messy. So if I had done the multi-resolution properly, uh, I would have been able to actually subdivide it more. And then, yeah, anyways, it was fine. What I'm doing here is you can see I'm taking the texture coordinates, normal output, running that through a separate color, taking the blue output, and then using a color ramp. That gives you a mask of only the top facing faces. And then I can mix two textures together. So it's like rock on the side. And then I put a moss texture on the top section there. Same thing works for snow if you want to do that or moss in this case. And then what I'm doing after that, after getting the basic texture on there is just dropping in some nice photo scans of actual rocks. These are, these ones are just from Quixel mega scans, which sort of still works if you have a uh, Quixel bridge still. If not, you can get these from the new fab system, which kind of sucks right now, but you can still get it from there if you want it. And then uh, I'm just dropping in a mix color node to to try and match the color of this rock to the color of the rock texture a little bit. I didn't quite get it here, but in a bit, I'll actually match it a bit more properly. So anytime you're bringing photo scans and textures and different models together, I like to color match it as closely as I can. And you can do that by adjusting the saturation level, the brightness level, and then the warmth or coldness level with uh, just a mixed color node and then mixing in some other warm or cool color. And if you can get those three levels sort of matched up to the surrounding textures, it sort of glues everything together and makes it all feel like it's all part of the same structure and rock and makes it a lot more seamless when you're just layering it on by having it like intersect through the model like this. So every time I do this, where I just take a rock and slam it into another model or texture where it's just completely uh, clipping through it like that, it always feels like I'm doing something wrong and like I'm not supposed to do that. But it's uh, as far as 3D art goes, I think it's a valid strategy to do this. So I don't really think there's anything wrong with just slapping it in there and having it completely intersect like that. And, you know, it just it works even though it feels like you're doing something totally wrong. So I'm just duplicating this one rock as many times as I feel like, and just putting it in all these different sections of the cliff that need more detail. And then dropping in a couple more photo scans, doing the same thing, and just repeating that until it is sort of more filled out with just a bunch of photo scans, filling in all of the areas that need more detail that the texture by itself underneath couldn't quite handle. So yeah, I'm just dropping in bigger more intricate shapes and just layering that on and just 
adjusting it and getting it all into the position that I think looks good. And eventually, after doing that for a few minutes, it looks kind of like a rocky cliff. You can see there, I also did swap that texture on top for a more green moss texture. And then I'm just dropping in kind of a scatter system from Botanic, which is this plant and tree add-on. And then I'm just going into weight paint mode and painting in just on, on top of that pathway so that uh, this will just create a vertex group in the highlighted area. And then I can choose in the scatter system exactly if I want those particles to come in in that vertex group or outside it. So you can see in a second, if I just brush in the area that I want, I can go down here, choose density, choose that group that I just added from weight painting, and then it'll only scatter plants in the desired path, which is perfect. So that doesn't just work in add-on. You can do that with geometry nodes. You can do that with a normal particle system, weight paint, and then just use that as the density mask. And then, yeah, I just chose another, I just added in one more grass scatter system, but for the most part, it's just the basic botanic preset of flowers and grass. And then, yeah, the, the foreground here was a bit of a mess throughout the whole process. So right now it's just kind of a conglomerate of different photo scans all layered together in kind of a bad way. So I did end up changing that later, but it, I left it kind of messy like this for now. And then I'm just dropping in a tree from uh, this guy called, he has a channel on ArtStation called Munich Office. They make pretty high quality trees for like two, three, four dollars. So if you want to just buy those, you can do that. They're pretty good. I like Botanic for like speedy kind of trees. And I like these ones for if there's one central main tree that needs more detail. I'm not affiliated or anything. It's just a good source of trees from Munich Office. And then, yeah, I'm just trying out different lighting setups. So um, I tried a few different HDRIs. I didn't really find anything here that I really liked, um, but I did end up with this sort of setup here where light was coming from the left side, hitting the cliff like that, which is sort of similar to what I ended up with, even though what I ended up with was more sunset. And then I'm just dropping in some random models here, stuff I've made in previous projects. So you, if you follow my art, you might recognize which one that is from. And it's just nice to drop in you know, when I'm not really sure what to do, I'm just, it's nice to drop in models and just l let that kind of help me decide where I want to take this. So I'm putting this, these two little pillars here, and I just felt like that was a nice thing to have uh, at the beginning of the path. Kind of makes it look a bit more inviting, makes it look like you want to walk down that path a little bit. And then I'm just dropping in some reference images of these different towers. I only spent like two, three minutes on Google, searched up ancient tower or something and then just dropped a few of those in there and that's just going to help me with uh, this modeling right here which I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do but if I'm just looking at the reference images off to the side and just going for something in that sort of range of what I had collected there that's going to really help me get a, a decent looking model and just help me stay on track when I'm making something like this so I'm just doing uh, a little dome insets extrusions just trying to get some basic detail in there. Making a little pillar here with just a cylinder, add some loop cuts, select certain sections, extrude certain parts in, and extrude certain parts the other way. So, boom, bring that out. Repeat that a couple more times, mirror it, throw in a bevel, and then I have a little, at least something that I can now throw in here. One easy way to get this duplicated in a circle around this thing is set the cursor to the middle of this structure. So you just select the main structure, cursor to selected, and then set your pivot point to the cursor, and then you can rotate any object around the 3D cursor. So it's a very easy way to get something kind of arrayed in a circle without an array modifier, just by duplicating it and then rotate it from that cursor point. And then I'm just doing more extrusions, insets, extrusions, repeating that a bunch of times. And there was, Actually, I wanted to have this sort of circular window here. Uh, the inspiration for this one was from, there's one church in Italy I'll try to find a picture of. I think it's in Italy, somewhere. And there's also one building in Dark Souls 3, which has this sort of window on it. Um, so that was a big inspiration for this too, was that tower. I'll put a picture of that up too. And then I'm just modeling these little Gothic pieces. Again, just looking at the reference images, 
going for trying to copy some little pieces here and there from different from these different structures so i'm just putting those gothic pieces on here again putting the cursor in the middle rotating these things then from the point of the cursor so it'll rotate perfectly all the way around and yeah just repeating that a bunch of times you can see i'm getting more and more pillars and stuff in here and one thing that i love to do to manage models like this is add a square empty any empty but square is a good one and then just put that in here so if you don't know an empty is not going to show up in the render it's only a thing that you can grab in the viewport and then i'll just parent all these loose parts to that empty so that any individual pillar or piece on this tower i can grab and move around freely as its own object but i can grab the entire thing all at once rotate it scale it around whatever by just selecting the empty now since they're all parented to that so it makes it a lot easier for texturing since i can have all the pillars linked together with their object data. So I, if I update one, it updates on all of them. They're all separate objects, I can move it around freely. But if I want to grab the whole thing, I can just grab the empty and just move it around however I want. So very handy. So right now it's kind of just looking like a Shrek kind of animation or something, just not where I want at all. But I brought in the sky and as soon as I saw some very slight orange tones in there, I knew that I wanted it to be this sort of vibrate right here, like a sunset kind of scenario. And I tried a, a bunch of different skies, which you'll see in a second. But the main lighting here was a bit weird. It ended up with being a, a combination of a spotlight and a sun lamp and like an area lamp and whatever. Um, but yeah, here is the sky that I ended up with was this one. It's just one from, straight from Unsplash. And then uh, just throwing in, you saw there a second ago, some volume. So just a volume cube over the whole scene with a volume scatter node as the shader. Same shader, same setup I've sh showed in all my, in a bunch of my previous videos. And then yeah, I'm just moving that tree around, spawning in more trees from Botanic. Yeah, trees like this are a really nice way to just add some life to the scene, add more detail, just creates a, a certain vibe, which is extremely easy to get when you just spawn in a tree like this, but it really does make a nice difference and creates a nice feeling in the scene a lot of the time. So I ended up duplicating one of those kind of gothic pillar spire things, whatever you call that, duplicating that a few times around the scene, and I really like I really like that, just kind of around a few times. And then I'm dropping in some clouds here. These are just some assets I made a long time ago. These are not VDB clouds. These are actually just images of clouds on a extruded plane, slightly extruded. And then it's running into actually a subsurface scattering node, which is the main driver of that shader. And you just mix it with a transparent as a mask. So it's a bit of an interesting setup. And it's a, it's a lot lighter on the scene than VDB clouds are. And it adds just enough atmosphere where it's worth doing. It doesn't look incredibly amazing. Like VDBs, I think, probably look better sometimes. But you can see it's just adding a nice sort of atmosphere to the scene. Just some smoky bits here and there. And then I found that the background sky wasn't quite wide enough for the focal length that I had in the scene. So I'm just going into Photoshop and doing a small generative expand. So it's just using AI to expand the image uh, came out quite handy actually. So it's a little bit soft on the edge. It's not quite high enough resolution as I'd want, but it's enough to where you can't really see. And it, it, it expands the image to the point where I was happy enough to use that in the render. And you'll see that I can actually now, now that it is a little bit wider, I can expand or rather uh, zoom out the camera a little bit more and then have the sky still fill in the space and feel like it uh, matches the focal length of the scene. So that was a really nice trick I haven't really tried before, but it worked out quite well. I'm dropping in these robe figures here, same ones I always use, um, but it's just a cloth simulation over a person model, and then I just deleted the person, and then scaled it in on the X and Y axis, like S, Shift, Z, and then scale it down a bit that way. And then here I'm dropping in some mountains from World Creator, which is a software you can get for like landscapes like this. So the way I do it is subdivide it 50 times, subdivision surface modifier on top of that, and then displacement modifier after that. And then inside that displacement modifier, you put the displacement map from world creator, and then just use the other textures in the shader editor. So that's the best way I found to add mountains from world creator. And that's just based off some tutorial I saw. So then for the main structure, I knew I needed to add a bit more detail. So I decided on a brick, like a red brick texture for the main thing here. These are all textures from Polyhaven. You can get them for free from their website. And then I just use this kind of like sandstone brick 
minimal brick texture. I don't know what it even is from again, Polyhaven. And then I just sort of matched the color of those a little bit more because they're a bit too far apart. One was a bit too bright, one was a bit too dark. So I ended up mixing in some grunge map type of thing from textures.com into one of those two, or maybe both of them. But yeah, I'm just spending a bit more time here detailing the tower because the the majority of the scene is pretty much good at this point, or like 80% good. But the tower was really lacking. So I just went in, spent some time adding details and just moving things around and just refining it to a point where I was a bit more happy with it. So you can see I'm just duplicating those gothic pillar things that I made earlier. Uh, just kind of cleaning stuff up where it's overlapping and then going in and just cutting things up where I don't really like these pillars. So yeah, I'd spend a little while just going in here, dropping in like arches, refining things, going in and doing more extrusions and details and stuff. And there's really nothing that special particularly I did, but just a, a, you know, a few minutes of doing that, eventually it starts to look better and more detailed. And it's pretty surprising how fast doing that adds up, even though each individual step, each individual step you're doing kind of feels you know pretty useless. Eventually after doing that, it does make a big difference to the overall amount of detail in the end. So yeah, you have to remember too that the total recording time was maybe four or five hours. And I've cut it down to we're at like 18, 17, 18 minutes in the video right now. So you, you're not seeing in this recording all of the frustration and all of the things that didn't work that I modeled that I ended up deleting, all the lighting setups that failed, all, all that stuff you're not seeing. You're just seeing only the steps that I did that mattered and moved it in a positive direction here. So just remember when you're making your own render, it probably won't feel you know, this might make it seem like it looks easy, but you have to remember I was experiencing the same thing that everyone experiences when they're making artwork like this. It's just, you know, it's a bit of a grind sometimes. So just keep that in mind when you're making yours. Like, it, it's not going to be a perfect 20 minute speed run where everything lines up perfectly and you just know exactly what to do from the beginning. It's, it's you know, my process is fairly normal where it's like a lot of trial and error and things that don't work, but I am trying ideas rapid fire, you know? And most of those are not going to land. I want to show you something kind of interesting here too. This is me just walking around the scene in Eevee. And this might just give you a different sort of perspective on exactly how this looks and how messy a lot of this stuff really is. So if you don't know, if you press Shift F, or I guess the shortcut is Shift, the uh, colon key or semicolon, it's walk fly mode. Just search that in the settings, you'll find it. So press that. You can go into first person mode in Blender. And then if you switch it to Eevee, obviously it won't look at as nice, but it's going to be in real time. And you can kind of just walk around like it's a video game up close. You know, there's only really as much detail as there needs to be. And things only look good from the perspective of the camera. And I'm not spending time detailing stuff you're not really going to see. And it's all just one big illusion from the camera's point of view to look good from that one angle. If you haven't tried this, it's really fun to just go in in first person and walk around too. I also want to point out too, if you've made it this far in the video, you should go and check out the new Cyber Environments course that I released at the beginning of this year. That'll teach you how to make these four cyberpunk renders from completely start to finish the whole way through. And I guarantee when you start doing this and you go through it, you'll be shocked at what you can accomplish with the tools that are already at your disposal. Plus you get a whole bunch of other tools included in the course, a bunch of asset packs, a whole community of artists, all the blend files and all the guidance that I can possibly give you. So there's a link below to that. Other than that, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.